and welcome to today's Office Hours Live. Woohoo! Woohoo! You know, <laughs> you know, we uh, we had Dolly Parton for uh, for a long time. Dolly Parton's you know Nine to Five was our kind of theme song, but in the era of Trump, uh, we thought it might be better to use Leonard Cohen. But what do you think? Uh, you know, the everybody knows, especially. Oh, I wanted to tell you. Uh, by the way. Uh, you will never, um, you will never guess what I received in the mail just a few days ago. <gasps> Woo! Yeah, yeah. It says, uh, it says, not just her signature, but also it says, love, <laughs> Dolly Parton. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, but Dolly, uh, we are live, you're live, I'm live, Dolly Parton is live, and unfortunately Leonard Cohen is no longer with us. Uh, this is a different era we are entering into, and uh, we will call it the Trump era, uh, and the resistance, the resistance. I want to talk about what it means to resist what is about to come down on all of us. Uh, and maybe the first way of beginning is to talk about... Uh, the new nominee for Secretary of State, a fellow named Rex Tillerson. Uh, now, the thing you need to know about Trump's nominee for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, is uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, here he is. Uh, since 1975, he has been CEO of Exxon Mobil. Uh, ExxonMobil is the eighth largest company in the entire world, uh, and not only is it a huge company, it's obviously a gigantic oil company. Uh, ExxonMobil, you may remember, was responsible for the worst oil spill in the history of oil spills, the Exxon Valdez. Uh, also, uh, it has been for years denying climate change. Uh, it had data in its possession that it did not share, showing clearly that the climate was changing and that human beings weren't responsible, uh, but it covered up those data. In fact, uh, Rex Tillerson has been quite active in that cover-up. Uh, it is violating and has a record, Exxon, Exxon Mobil, of violating human rights around the world, dealing with tyrannical governments, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, all over the world, including Putin. We're going to talk about Putin a little bit more, uh, but the Putin connection, the human rights problems, the environmental problems, uh, this in a way, in fact in a very profound way, uh, makes Rex Tillerson of uh, ExxonMobil perhaps the, mo the worst possible candidate you could have as Secretary of State. I mean, after all, the Secretary of State, the State Department, is supposed to be, is the lead agency on environment, on our negotiation uh, of environmental uh, treaties with the rest of the world, on the Paris Accord. I mean, the Secretary of State uh, takes the lead on global human rights enforcement, global human rights negotiation. The Secretary of State uh, is in charge of America's diplomacy, not to plunder the planet uh, in terms of uh, energy resources, uh, but to actually maintain the peace and organize the planet in a way uh, that is conducive to the interests of the planet in the future uh, with regard to the environment, human rights, and so on. So why in the world would you want somebody who is the president, CEO of the largest energy company, one of the largest energy companies, plundering the planet? This is another example, friends, of how Donald Trump is nominating people uh, the equivalent of, of, of nominating arsonists uh, to be in charge of the fire department. I mean, take a look. Uh, we have recently, for the labor department, we have a fellow named Andrew Puzner. Andrew Puzner is anti-labor. He, uh, he runs a chain of, of, of hamburger uh, uh, stores, hamburger outfits, uh, Carl's Jr., Hardee's. Uh, he pays his, his people near minimum wage. He is against raising the minimum wage. He's against enforcing labor laws. Half of his establishments were found by the Labor Department to have wage and hour violations. He's against labor unions. He's going to be in charge of the Labor Department. Or look at the EPA. You've got in charge of the EPA, Scott Pruitt, 
the Attorney General of Oklahoma, who's led the charge against all of the environmental regulations that the Obama administration has put in place. Or you have somebody for treasurer, Steve Mnuchin, who is from Goldman Sachs, who basically views the economy the same way that Wall Street views the economy, that is, as a great big gambling operation. You have somebody for Health and Human Services, Representative Tom Price, who has led the charge against Obamacare, against the Affordable Care Act, doesn't want there to be any kind of public subsidized health care. You've got, for education, you've got Betsy DeVos, who has spent her entire career. She has no idea about education. She's not uh, somebody who has actually been in education. She has instead spent her entire career, her fortune, she's another billionaire, arguing against public schools and in favor of charter schools and taxpayer money for charter schools and religious schools. You have for HUD, Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, who has been publicly against the Fair Housing Act and much of what the Housing and Urban Development Department does. You have for Attorney General, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, who could not even be appointed under a Republican Congress to the federal courts because of his racist past, his racist remarks and racist actions. You have for energy, uh, Governor Rick Perry of Texas, former Governor Rick Perry of Texas, who you may remember in the 2011 run-up to the 2012 election, he was asked what departments he'd get rid of, and he couldn't even remember that he had listed of uh, the three departments he wanted to eliminate, the Energy Department. Arsonists in charge of the Fire Department. And that's not even including the people who are going to be inside the White House, who don't need to have Senate confirmation. Uh, Gary Cohn, the National Economic Council, he is the president of Goldman Sachs. You've got National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, who has been on record as saying, don't trust any Muslims. You've got a Chief Strategist Steve Bannon, who is one of the heroes of the alt-right movement, which is white supremacists. Put it all together. And what you have is a, the beginnings of administration that is essentially a takeover of our democracy with people who not only don't believe in the purposes and functions and laws that they are supposed to be enforcing, but also people who fundamentally are antithetical to the direction America should be going in, has been going in, will eventually be going in again. Which gets us to what's going to happen next Monday. The, the Electoral College is going to be meeting. That is, every state's electors will be meeting in the state capitals. And the question is whether Donald Trump is going to get the 270 electoral votes that he needs to become president. I think it's very, very likely uh, that he will. Uh, but there's a possibility. It is a small possibility. I don't want to mislead you into thinking this is a large possibility. Uh, but if only 37 Trump electors decide that Trump is unfit to be president, then we will not have Donald Trump as president. I can't tell you who we will have. It will probably go to the House of Representatives. But the arguments against Trump being the next president and why the Electoral College should do its work has to do with one Trump's financial conflicts of interest. He refuses to put them into a blind trust. He has financial conflicts of interest all over the place. He said early this morning, he tweeted that what he will do is he will turn over everything to his sons 
and that he will not enter into and his sons won't enter into any new real estate ventures well that hardly that hardly matters does it because he's got investments all over the world and those investments have particular financial interests attached to them. What Trump and his family presumably want to do is maximize the returns, as much profits as possible from those investments. And yet there are all sorts of conflicts of interest in terms of those investments and what may be necessary and good for the United States, for President Trump to actually do with regard to the interest of the United States. Electors pay attention to this. He will not put them into blind trust. The chief ethics officer of the George W. Bush administration has gone public saying that the electors under these circumstances should not make Trump president because of these conflicts of interest. But there is also something else and that is these questions hanging over the incipient Trump administration about foreign influence. One other reason we have an electoral college going right back to Alexander Hamilton's writings in, in Federalist 68 is to make sure that there is no foreign power that influences or has influence over that president. But what, what, what do we have now? We have a CIA report, a secret CIA report, and we know from the leaks that it contends that Putin and the Russian government have intervened in our election intentionally to help Donald Trump. We also have Trump's financial deals, and there is a lot of evidence that he has financial deals with the oligarchs in Russia and with Putin. He's not, though, releasing his tax returns, so we don't know exactly the extent of those deals. We know that key Trump aides during the election, such as Paul Manafort, the campaign manager, received millions of dollars from Putin cronies. We know that Rex Tillerson is a very close ally, business connection to Putin, received one of the highest orders of friendship and awards from Putin not that long ago. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not anti-Russian I am spouting. This is concern about Putin, concern about the tyranny of Putin, the human rights violations of Putin. The fact that Putin is one of the worst dictators and tyrants on the globe right now. My message to the electors, if you know any electors or if any electors are watching this right now, or maybe you're watching this later, do not, I don't think you have a reasonable responsibility of putting Trump in, even if you are a so-called Trump elector, unless Trump releases his tax returns, because we don't know his extent of his Russian-Putin connections. We also, and I think you should insist that he put all of his assets into a blind trust and commit to doing so before next Monday, before you meet. And also, this is not possible to make a, a judgment about the CIA report unless the administration releases the CIA report before next Monday as well. Am I being unreasonable, folks? Electors, Trump electors, listen to me. Am I being unreasonable? I think you have a duty coming up next Monday. All right. On that note, let's take your your questions, and I hope you have a lot of questions. Scott Almberg, uh, what are the rules and laws around unfaithful electors? You're talking about electors who actually uh, choose their conscience. Uh, can they be sued or lose their careers if unfaithful? They're not going to be. They're not going to lose their careers. Uh, some states do have penalties uh, for electors that may not follow through on their so-called pledges. And those penalties can be financial fines. Uh, and uh, I would say to electors in states where you might want to exercise your conscience rather than to vote for Trump, uh, find out what those fines are. Uh, there is organ there's an organization that, said, that wrote to me a couple of days ago that actually uh, has committed to essentially paying any fines 
that Trump electors might be up against if they are in one of those states. Uh, Ann Monahan, what's your response to Larry Lessig's idea that there's a viable challenge to the Electoral College's winner-take-all model on constitutional grounds that it's a violation of one person, one vote? Uh, Ann, I think it's an interesting idea. I don't know whether the Supreme Court, given the kind of Supreme Court we are likely to have, a Trump Supreme Court, at least five Republican appointees, uh, would care about Larry Lessig's argument. I think more importantly, uh, is a groundswell, a movement in many states to get the states to change their laws so that the states commit in future presidential elections that all of their electors will support whoever wins the popular vote. And I don't have to remind you that the vote count, the lead of Hillary Clinton, keeps on rising. It's now 2.6 million lead over Donald Trump. That is the largest lead in modern history. That is five times the lead that uh, George W. Bush had over Al Gore. Alan Crudel, Cruden. Uh, I see that members of the Electoral College have asked to be briefed by the intelligence community on Russian influence in the election. Given they don't have the necessary security clearance, will this really be meaningful? Uh, well, Alan, I did not know that they had asked to be briefed. Uh, it can be quite meaningful. They are not going to have security clearance, I don't believe. But the mere fact that several have asked, I think, is quite significant. Uh, Lee Hawkins, do you think electoral college voting should be secret? Perhaps more electors would vote for Hillary. Uh, Lee, uh, it's not secret in the sense that we will know the results. But you are right, we will not know individual electors unless... Now, this is, depends on state law. State law is slightly different in terms of whether electors have to actually make public who they are voting for. Most states, they do. Uh, Steph uh, K., what's the end game? There are dots connecting what? What do you see as the strategy between the new, new administration and Russia. Uh, I am worried, frankly, that by being so close to Putin, whether or not the CIA secret report is correct and their conclusion is re correct about Putin's involvement in the election on behalf of Trump, I think there are problems with regard to being that close to a tyrant, a dictator, the world's one of the world's uh, greatest and uh, worst dictators. Uh, and the problem has to do with human rights around the world. It, they have to do with human rights even in the United States. Uh, there have been allegations. Uh, in fact, there has been some proof that some enemies of Putin have been murdered outside, the, outside Russia. Uh, in Britain, for example. Uh, Kelly Lang, I don't understand why the IRS doesn't end the Trump audit and then the press, electors, and so on can demand to see his tax returns. Uh, Kelly, there is nothing legally about an IRS audit that prohibits any of us, that is through uh, our representatives, through uh, the administration, uh, from seeing uh, what those returns are. Donald Trump right now, in other words, could offer up his tax returns even though they are being audited. Uh, he's using the audit as a smokescreen uh, to justify his not providing those tax returns. Frankly, I don't think he can do that anymore. Again, I want to stress this. There is nothing about being audited by the IRS that makes it illegal or unseemly or even unethical to share your tax returns with the public. Wayne Downing Sr., could you please explain what the economic damage, not just the environmental damage, of the destruction of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, the economic damage, it seems to me, would be quite substantial because you can't separate the environment from the economy. For example, as we know, the weather patterns are becoming more severe uh, in the United States, elsewhere around the world, uh, which means hurricanes, uh, droughts, uh, other forms of extreme weather are going to affect our economy, our society, as well as other places around the world. That has a direct economic impact. It also has a political impact because as we see climate change, as we see less arable land, more droughts, as we see more extreme weather, we also see more 
confrontations, more competition among various peoples for the available resources, the available Arab, arable uh, uh, land, la agricultural land, and so forth. Uh, there is a direct correlation between the pending environmental catastrophes we are seeing around the world or actually already experiencing around the world and political turmoil around the world and that affects us politically it also affects us economically uh, robert fortner uh, thanks for be <laughs> thanks for being awesome well thank you robert i appreciate that uh, josh uh, mosteller do you still think there's a long-term decline of american conservatism uh, josh i think what we are now seeing is not conservative versus liberal now, although, as I said, we do have the arsonists about to take over the fire departments with regard to many departments, uh, the issue here is becoming more and more about our democracy. In other words, when Donald Trump threatens individual people by tweeting that anyone who criticizes him is a bad person in some way, uh, uses character assassination, when he has these large rallies that, to me at least, resemble kind of 1930s fascist rallies, where uh, basically he's going around, he says, he says that they are thank you rallies, but they are basically, they are a, a kind of celebrating his victory, uh, criticizing, again, his opponents. All of these, combined with what he is doing to the State Department, to the EPA, to elsewhere, to me, all of these are about threatens uh, they, they threaten our democracy. They, they threaten essential democratic values. Uh, his uh, putting into his national security advisor position somebody who says, don't trust Muslims, uh, that to me, and it should be, I think, to you, is a de direct affront uh, to freedom of religion in the United States. We have a lot of Muslim Americans in America. John Patrick uh, Lofney, did I pronounce that correct? Correctly, can you give uh, me something to be hopeful for? Just one thing. I think we really need it. Yes, uh, John, I am going to give you something, and I was going to save it for later, but I will start it right now. I think that the Trump administration is going to get more people, more active, to become much more much more activist, much more engaged in American politics uh, than ever before in a way that kind of clears the debris. We can see what's really at stake here. As I said, what's really at stake is our democracy. This should not be a left versus right issue. Uh, when Donald Trump started to attack a labor leader, and he went then, uh, before that, after the head of, of Boeing, uh, because they leveled criticisms against him, that's not a left-right issue. I think the good news here is that over the next months, or even the next years, Americans will see what really unites us. What unites us is a belief in democracy and a belief in freedom. And authoritarian, despot, despotic measures, such as we are beginning to see in the incipient Trump administration, is going to ignite a, a demand, a demand from all of us that we get big money out of politics, that we get rid of crony capitalism, uh, that we actually uh, prevent uh, the kind of Exxon Mobiles and the Goldman Sachs and the, and the big corporations and the big financial institutions that were, are going to take over uh, the Trump administration or are going to be part of the Trump administration, uh, that we actually no longer allow our democracy to be submerged in this way. But I'll get back to this. Quentin Kermin, regarding your appeal on behalf of Inequality Media, uh, can you give us an idea of the goal of the campaign? Uh, Quentin, uh, the goal is $200,000. We're about $150,000 there already. I want to thank everybody who has helped us. Inequality Media uh, helps bring uh, our videos and our live broadcasts and everything else we're doing to you. Uh, it's a shoestring. Uh, we need your help. And by the way, it is also tax deductible. Uh, Bruce Hallahan. Uh, what's the existential threat to Western democracy posed by nativist, nationalist, and extreme right-wing movements in the USA and the world? Uh, Bruce, I think the existential threat is to the essence of American democracy, and that is tolerance and freedom and responsiveness to the people rather than 
a kind of tyranny uh, in which we are scared to speak our minds uh, because of the centralized power uh, that begins to be asserted by a, a tyrant. Uh, now, I'm not going to say right now, publicly, that Donald Trump is a tyrant, or, or, but, but, but there, are, there are things we need to worry about uh, in terms of his, his tendencies. We saw it during the campaign. We are seeing it even, even more uh, as, as president-elect. What happens when he is in charge of the IRS and the CIA and the FBI? What happens when this man who is thin-skinned and vindictive, uh, who is interested, it seems, only in power and dominance, begins to actually exercise presidential power? This is why we need all of us to be vigilant and engaged and part of a peaceful resistance. Uh, Doug Cohen, what was your undergraduate major? Uh, I was an undergraduate major in art history, Doug. I studied economics and law in graduate school. Brian Chandler, why should the media change their ways if they profited so much off of Trump? What would uh, incentivize them not to do that again? Uh, Brian, an important question. I think the media are enablers and were enablers with regard to Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump is is fun to watch on television because he's so unpredictable. He is uh, so outrageous. He says whatever comes into his head. He's an entertainer. He's a con man. Uh, and therefore, he drives up media ratings. That's what he did through the campaign. So the media gave him extraordinary amounts of free airtime, and they continue to give him extraordinary amounts of free airtime. They're airing his uh, rallies in ways that I don't remember a previous president-elect ever, ever having rallies and having them aired. Uh, they are also kind of giving him the kind of treatment as, as a president-elect that no president-elect has had. This, this lead-up, this transition up to the Donald Trump presidency is a, a kind of spectacle. Uh, this is another form of, uh, of television uh, that is a live television performance, if you will. Uh, and I think it's very important that the media be held accountable. I think we need, all of us need, uh, to write letters, uh, express ourselves in, uh, in our own newspapers, uh, uh, tell the media to stop treating Donald Trump as if he is an entertainer and a, a vehicle for making more money for the media. Martha Culver, what do you think about the failure of Medicare and Social Security, or the future? Uh, Marta, I was a trustee in my former life, not that long ago, of both the Social Security and also the Medicare trust funds. Social Security trust fund does not have a problem. It could be, uh, it could be the problems could be solved very easily. Uh, just raise and now it sounds, under the Trump administration, I will eat this cardboard if, in fact, he did something about this, but just raise uh, the uh, income level, the, the cap on income subject to Social Security taxes. Uh, you could do that. Uh, it would be, make the whole Social Security system more progressive and also solve any problems. Medicare is slightly more complicated, but the problem is not Medicare itself. The problem is you have all these baby boomers uh, who are becoming older and they need more uh, medical care and it's a problem of our entire medical system. It's our problem of, of health insurance. And by the way, nothing that Donald Trump or Paul Ryan or the Republicans are proposing is going to help it. In fact, it's going to make it much worse because if you get rid of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and also you do what Paul Ryan wants to do and that is privatize and voucherize Medicare you are going to leave so many people in the lurch, particularly older people who do have pre-existing conditions or do have uh, problems that need attending to. Final question. Uh, Hannah Carlson, uh, you mentioned people being afflicted by two syndromes, normalizing the Trump situation and being so upset they become immobilized. What's the best antidote to both? Uh, Hannah, uh, 
This is a good question for being the last question because I do, as I travel around the country and I, as I talk to many people, I, I am worried about these two tendencies. One tendency is to normalize the Trump administration, as you said, uh, to basically say, uh, well, or the incipient, the coming Trump administration, to say, oh, well, uh, it, we've had conservative administrations before. Uh, this is just uh, another conservative administration, uh, like Nixon or, or uh, Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush. This is not a normal conservative administration. As I want to emphasize to you, it's not just the quality of people that Trump is nominating who have no experience and who are actually the antithesis of the departments they are supposed to be heading. It is the fact that Donald Trump himself is not a normal person. Now, how can I say this delicately? I believe he does have a personality disorder. And I believe that by normalizing this, by simply saying, well, this is just a, another conservative president, we are overlooking something that is potentially very dangerous. Do not fall into the trap of normalizing this. Now, the other trap at the other extreme is being immobilized, being so afraid and so stupefied and so numbed uh, by how outrageous uh, Trump continues to be, like some of the appointments I talked about before, but also everything else he is doing, how he is acting, uh, living in a kind of Louis XIV tower uh, and, and, and being catered to as if he were king uh, and his, his court. I mean, th this we have not seen this. And, and so many people are so outraged by what he is doing, by Donald Trump and the thought of Donald Trump as president that that they're immobilized. Uh, they say, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I'm, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm just going to spend the, 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 the next four years under my bed or, or tending my own garden or, no. Both of those responses, normalization or being immobilized, it seems to me, don't help. What we need to do, do all of us, is be mobilized. Now you ask, well, what, what does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean, at the very least, being active, uh, writing letters, demonstrating. Uh, there's going to be a women's march on Washington the day after the inauguration. Uh, some people have suggested uh, a national general strike on inauguration day. I'd be very interested in your views about that. But beyond demonstrations and beyond strikes, there's also the notion of being active with regard to the 2018 midterm elections, making sure that we have a Congress that is going to oppose the tyranny of Donald Trump, making sure we have a Congress that is going to oppose the regressiveness of a Trump administration, making sure we have a Congress that knows when Donald Trump is breaking the law and will impeach him. Now, maybe that means also working on a lot of the Republicans who are there or will be there starting in January. I want to remind you of something. You, every one of you watching this, is a potential leader. Every one of you watching this is a citizen activist. You are in a country that was founded by citizen activists. You are in a society that depends on you and us and we, the people. It is up to us. The resistance starts here and now. Thank you. See you next week.